So thank you and welcome today. I'm very excited to be here um, to present to you today on intermittent pneumatic compression and lymphedema management. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. So as Carla said, um, I'm a therapist at the Pasqua Hospital um, on the lymphedema service and I've uh, been there for the past 16 years. And I worked in the lymphedema area for quite a few years before I became certified as a certified lymphedema therapist. And years ago, the standard course of treatment for lymphedema was the use of pumps as well as compression garments. And over time, um, with uh, research and just further developments in the area, um, the treatment progressed to what's called the gold standard of treatment today, complex decongestive therapy. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, that whole picture uh, today of, of treatment of lymphedema, including CDT and lymphedema uh, pumps. So when we talk about lymphedema pumps, there's a lot of discussion around them. Lymphedema pumps, or intermittent pneumatic compression, has been used in lymphedema management since the 1950s. So again, the, goal, the treatment uh, protocol years ago included um, compression garments and mainly pump for, and education around lymphedema as the main course of treatment. And over time, um, there had been some changes in the, the pump therapy. So in the 50s, it started off with single chamber pumps. And then in the 70s, uh, it progressed to uh, segmented pumps. And then uh, over time, we've now come to what we're using today, some advancements in pump therapy uh, and the new pumps, which we're going to focus on today, that mimic manual lymphatic drainage and uh, have um, a a manual component that drains the torso as well as the limb. So some of the things that when we talk about lymphatic pumps, it's a little bit controversial. Um, years ago, um, as I said, the main course of treatment was the use of pumps and compression garments, and then there was some advancements. And uh, when CDT came into the picture, there was a lot of controversy about whether or not to continue with pumps, and we heard a lot of discussion around there. And there was reasons for that. Um, I think when we, as a physical therapist, in our undergraduate training, we did learn about uh, pump therapy, but we certainly, uh, as we came out, we had a very limited knowledge of lymphedema in our undergraduate degree and limited knowledge of use of pump within lymphedema treatment. And so um, as therapists, we were the main um, professional using pumps and in some cases, I think pumps were not used properly um, as a result because of that limited knowledge. And so there was a lot of patients that were provided with pumps without that sort of full spectrum of lymphedema treatment. And so there was some misuse as well as the pumps developed over time and with research, they became uh, more progressive and included now the treatment of manual lymphatic drainage within the pump, so much more effective. So there was a period of time where um, pumps were very controversial and they were thought to be not good. And so you hear a lot of things that still to this day um, um, are referred to. So you hear things like pumps are bad, um, they're the old school treatment to lymphedema, I don't believe in pumps, CDT is the gold standard, that's the only treatment that should be used, um, pumps are harmful. Uh, pumps don't work uh, and then there's also well how do I even use a pump so um, again in our undergraduate training we have very limited education around pumps I know when I went through school um, we spent basically a half an afternoon in our clinical um, uh, modalities course on lymphedema pumps and then we had a practical session and in that session our pump didn't even work so we just had to pretend to put it onto the patient so then when we graduated it was really uh, unclear on how to really use this in lymphedema management also too as uh, Carla referred to um, we now have 13 therapists that are trained in CDT, which is um, complex decongestive therapy. And again, that's what's considered the gold standard uh, treatment in lymphedema. And in traditional CDT courses, they don't teach pump. So even though they're, they come out with this certification in lymphedema management, uh, they really don't have the background in using pumps because that's not part of the course. Uh, so a lot of these therapists are going um, from the research and 
old research, there was a period of time where there were some, some um, issues surrounding the pumps that were used, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in the presentation today. So a lot of times uh, in these courses, the, the students that are going through are hearing some of these things about pump because, again, it's not, um, it's not taught. It's just basically on some, some research and older research. And a lot of these therapists that are involved in the training don't have any clinical experience with the pump. They've never actually used it. So it's interesting. And um, that's why today we're going to go into a little bit more detail, kind of review the knowledge, and um, show you how pump can be a very useful adjunct to lymphedema management. So today, in terms of the objectives of the course, we're going to review some basic principles of lymphedema. So um, for the CLT therapist, this is going to be very basic. Um, but there's a lot of people in the audience today that don't have a background in lymphedema. So I'm going to spend most of my presentation reviewing some basic principles of lymphedema so that you understand the use of pump in lymphedema management. And then the next presenter is going to go into more of the technicalities of the actual use of pump um, and more of the, the detail around the pump. We're going to talk about some of the types of pumps that have been used um, over the years. And uh, again, we're going to focus on the new pump, the Lymphedema Optimal. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the evidence that's out there for the use of IPC in lymphedema and understand how to apply uh, the use of IPC in that big picture of lymphedema management. So again, my presentation is going to be more sort of that bigger picture of lymphedema and the use of pump, and the next presentation is going to go into much more clinical detail and uh, specifics about pump use. So as Carla mentioned, um, we had a lymphedema working group over the last uh, two years. We had two phases, um, initial lymphedema working group and then an implementation group. And out of the result of that working group, um, as Carla mentioned, there was 13 therapists that were trained through the government um, in CDT management. As well, there was some education initiatives and the distribution of lymphopress optimal pumps throughout the health regions. So it, previous to that, um, when we, t when we worked with the government, we did a presentation on lymphedema. And when it came to pumps, um, one of our issues was the pumps that they had currently in place through their loan prog program were inefficient and unsafe. They weren't proper for lymphedema management, and that was causing some of the problems around pump. Um, that the pump that was being used was not effective. And so we talked to them about the new advancements in pump therapy and the new models that are out there that do provide a more um, comprehensive drainage aspect and are quite effective, and talked about the need to replace those old pumps with these safer, more effective uh, versions. We also had patients on our panel, and it was really the patients that um, led to the pumps being purchased for the regions. So um, it was very uh, instrumental having the patients on the panel because they were really able to express the um, true needs of a lymphedema patient and um, what they find helpful in terms of managing this long-term um, chronic condition for them. And pump does play a role in that. Uh, so CDT before this point was mainly private, um, privately funded treatment. There wasn't many, uh, CD, I was the only CDT therapist in the public system and many patients can't afford to, um, to go through full comprehensive CDT treatment publicly, or sorry, privately. And so there was a need to offset that with some public services. And uh, because of that, there's still limited resources within the public system. And we did try to, to also, through our lymphedema working group, um, try to expand coverage for private uh, treatment as well, because again, many patients cannot afford to go through CDT treatment. And so we were looking at what are some other options to help offset um, some of that and provide better care for treatment for lymphedema patients. And PUMP plays a role in that um, because it can afford patients to manage at home and also come through the public system to uh, get that regular treatment that they may not be able to go for um, privately. So um, at the end of the presentation, we'll take questions. If you can hold your questions till the end, we'll have a period of time where we can um, uh, definitely answer questions that come up. 
And uh, we do have a patient coming at the end of the presentation to give a patient perspective on the use of pump in, in her particular case of lymphedema. So we're going to start by defining lymphedema. So lymphedema is the swelling of a body part, most often an arm or leg, caused by the abnormal accumulation of high protein fluid resulting from impairment to the lymphatic system. So lymphedema can develop when lymphatic vessels are missing or impaired, and in that case we call it primary. So when someone is born with a system that is not formed properly, they're missing vessels or the vessels that they have do not function properly, or when lymph vessels are damaged um, or removed. So we, see, we call that secondary lymphedema, and that can result from things like the most common type of secondary is cancer-related lymphedema, where lymph nodes are removed or damaged by cancer-related treatment. Um, other types include traumatic um, with, let's say, orthopedic injuries, or uh, other types of secondary include bariatric-related or combined with um, other pathologies, vascular-type edemas. In the literature right now, there's no standard definition um, that is, uh, is used for lymphedema. There's a variety of methods that's, that are used to def define it. And uh, in the clinical setting, the most common uh, methods that are used to define lymphedema are either circumferential measurements, where we take circumference measures at certain points um, throughout the limb. And Generally, two centimeters or more at any one point is clinically significant for lymphedema. And then that can further be defined in terms of severity. So uh, in, in terms of circumferential, we refer to mild lymphedema as a difference of one to three centimeters, moderate three to five, and severe greater than five. The other most common and accepted um, measurement for defining lymphedema is limb volume. And so um, based on the circumferential measurements and some calculations, we can determine limb volume. And generally, a, a difference of 20% um, is clinically significant for lymphedema. So again, that can be um, broken down into severity. So mild, less than 20, moderate, 20 to 40, and severe, greater than 40. So this applies to unilateral limb lymphedema. So we're comparing the affected side to the non-affected side. Um, uh, there's no standard uh, clinical definitions for severity for bilateral, genital, uh, truncal lymphedema at this point in time. So in order to understand lymphedema, we have to talk about what the lymphatic system does. So our lymphatic system has two main roles in our body. It has a circulatory um, function. It works with our um, circulation system, our arteries and veins, to help move fluid through the body. And it has an immunological uh, role as well. It helps keep our tissues free of infection and disease. So in terms of circulation, our limb system plays a big role in transporting various substances from our tissue spaces, or interstitium, back into the bloodstream. So it will transport substances such as water, proteins, various cells, and large molecules. So our lymphatic vessels are a little bit bigger. Our transport lymphatic vessels are a little larger than uh, veins. And so some of the larger molecules that build up into the interstitium will um, transport back into the bloodstream more easy, easier in front, through the lymphatic system than our venous system. And so in particular, those large molecules like bacteria and viruses, but um, especially proteins. Our lymph system has a big role in maintaining protein circulation in our body. And uh, um, our lymphatic fluid has a high concentration of protein, and that's what distinguishes lymphedema from other types of uh, edemas. It's that protein concentration. So by transporting the fluid from the interstitium back into the bloodstream, um, the lymph system will transport about 10% of what collects in our tissue spaces back into the bloodstream. The rest goes through the venous circulation. And by transporting those substances back from the tissue spaces into the bloodstream, it helps to um, maintain blood volume as well as protein circulation. So it plays a role in homeostasis in our body. It transports about half of the circulating proteins in our in our bloodstream. Now, in terms of the immunological functions, our lymph nodes and lymph organs throughout our body, so tonsils, spleen, um, uh, thymus, gland, 
those produce lymphocytes and uh, various um, immune response cells. And they circulate those cells throughout the body. And there's regional lymph nodes found in our head and neck region, our armpit, abdomen, and groin, where that fluid that's picked up from the vessels gets transported to, and the lymph nodes will produce an immune response that helps to clean out and filter that fluid. So it will filter things such as bacteria, viruses, all the waste products, toxins, uh, damaged tissue, tissue, disease cells that build up into our tissue spaces. And then in the intestinal region, our lymphatic system does have a special function. Um, it absorbs and transports fat. So that's the only region where you'll see that lymph will also have a component of fat. And usually lymph is a clear fluid. In the intestinal region, it has a cloudy white appearance because of that fat composition. So basically, when blood enters our circulation system, our arteries and veins, and it travels through, so the, the blood pumps the, the blood through the arteries, it travels through the vessels, some of the products in the blood will filter out into the tissue spaces. So things like water, uh, proteins, red blood cells that carry oxygen, some of those immune cells, nutrients. And the cells in the tissues will use what they need at that particular moment in time for metabolism, for energy during our day-to-day -day activities. And when they're done metabolizing those products, the waste products, um, broken down uh, red blood cells, um, used up materials, the waste products, will filter out into the tissue spaces. So so in between all our tissues, we have a little bit of space referred to as the interstitial space. So we have basically all the waste products of what the cells are using. Uh, and then anything that comes into the tissues as well, things like bugs and viruses. Uh, if there's a damaged uh, area, so we get an injury, there's some damaged cells, there's inflammatory products, uh, we get an infection, there's products of, of that infection, all that will um, build into that interstitial space. And essentially that's what um, makes up lymph. So it's mostly water, proteins, cells, um, again, various... Uh, um, uh, immune response cells, waste products, foreign materials like those bugs and vir viruses, damaged cells, and again in the intestinal region, a little bit of fat. And that's essentially what lymph fluid is made up of. As it collects into the tissues, um, it will uh, be picked up by the lymphatic vessels. So we have a complicated network of uh, um, four la layers of lymphatic vessels that uh, once the initial collectors pick that fluid up, um, it will take the lymph nodes up to the lymph node regions. Now, our lymph system doesn't have a central pump like our, our circulation system, so the heart pumps that fluid out to the arteries and, and back through the veins. Uh, our lymphatic system relies on a couple different things to move that fluid. So um, within the actual transport vessels that move the lymphatic fluid, um, there's little valves and there's a, a three-layer um, wall system that has some muscle component to it. And it's regulated by the sympathetic nervous system that will cause some intrinsic contraction to the vessel, um, as well as uh, it's, uh, it's going to be propelled by muscle contraction and abdominal pressure. Uh, so it relies on the muscles and the pressure generated um, through our abdomen, abdomen area to um, uh, that puts pressure on the biggest lymphatic vessel, the thoracic duct, that helps to mobilize that fluid through the tissues, through the vessel system up to those regional lymph nodes. Once it gets to the regional lymph nodes, again, the lymph nodes will stimulate an immune response and it will clean out and filter that fluid. So those bugs and viruses, those disease cells, the waste products, they will get broken down and cleared out of that fluid, goes through the rest of our system, gets broken down some more, and essentially we eliminate that out. That filtered fluid that's left over over that has some of the proteins, some of the water, some of those cells, will leave the regional uh, lymph node um, regions and then go through the rest of the lymphatic vessel system. Um, they enter what we call lymphatic trunks. And then eventually all of those trunks that uh, drain each part of the body drain into two main areas. The biggest lymphatic vessel in our body is called the thoracic duct. It starts about our belly button region, comes up our midline, pierces the diaphragm. And it drains into um, one of the cyclavian veins in the neck. The other lymphatic trunk is what we refer to as our right thoracic duct. It drains uh, the right side of the head and neck and the right arm. 
the thoracic duct drains the rest of our body. And eventually, all that fluid collects into those ducts and drains back into two veins in our neck. So those good products, the water proteins, go back into the bloodstream, and all the other products get filtered out through the lymph system. So when we talk about um, the physiology of lymphedema or any type of edema, we refer to Starling's um, equilibrium for fluid exchange. And basically what Starling's um, equilibrium states is that um, the pressure, um, I always get this, I, I'm going to just read, read it right out here. So under normal conditions, a state of near equilibrium exists at the level of the capillary membrane. So basically what that means is the amount of fluid that normally filters out at the arterial end of the capillary is almost equal to the exact amount of fluid that gets reabsorbed from the tissue space back into the venous end. There's about 10% of fluid that remains in the interstitium that doesn't go back into the venous end, and that's the part that gets pushed back into the bloodstream through the lymphatic system. So there's usually a normal gradient of, of pressures that exist at the capillary arterial end, okay? And um, I'm not gonna go into great detail. There's a lot of physiology, physics behind this. But basically, there's a normal pressure gradient that results in a net filtration of fluid going from the capillary arterial end into the interstitium, and then there's a fluid balance that helps to pull that fluid back up into the venous end, except for about 10%, which um, creates that lymph load. Now, anything that disrupts that pressure gradient can result in edema. Okay? So if that balance is thrown off, we're gonna start seeing increased fluid in that tissue space. And under normal conditions, our lymph system usually can cope, but when there's a problem with the lymph system, um, that's when we start to see issues um, with lymphedema. So for example, anything that's gonna cause dilation of the capillary end, so things like some of our treatment modalities, heat, uh, anything that causes inflammation, um, so deep massage techniques, uh, aggressive activities, um, uh, things like infection or trauma to that limb, that's going to result in more filtration out into the interstitium. If our limb system is not functioning properly, it's gonna, that's going to cause an overload and lead to lymphedema. Same thing goes on the other end. If we start to see some venous obstruction, so um, what we call passive hyperemia, if there's an obstruction on that venous end, such as, let's say, a DVT, um, that's going to create backflow into that blood capillary, the arterial end, and that's going to then create more pressure and through... Um, diffusion, that's going to result in more filtration. So we'll start to see more load on that limb system. Now, under normal conditions, um, our limb system has what we call a transport capacity. So that's the max amount of lymph that's transported within the lymphatic system working as hard as possible in a given length of time. And that transport capacity is usually about 10 times higher than the normal amount of lymph load that's produced. So on an average day, they say two to four liters of lymph fluid is processed through our body. Our lymph system will clear about two to four liters. It will filter and um, recycle um, back into the bloodstream. But the transport capacity is about 10 times that. So our lymph system, has a built-in capacity to deal with increased lymph load. So when we are exercising intensely, we have increased circulation. When we're sick, we have some different pathologies that may lead to a little bit more fluid into that interstitium. Normally, our system can cope. It has what we call a functional reserve. Um, and that functional reserve is the difference between that transport capacity and lymph load. So there's a certain amount that our lymph system can cope with when that lymph load increases. Now, when we refer to edema, um, there's two different um, things that can happen. We can get what's called a dynamic insufficiency. So in this case, that lymph load exceeds the transport capacity of the lymph system. So in this case, we have a normal lymphatic system, but uh, that lymph load, that fluid that's starting to build up into the interstitium, starts going beyond that normal capacity of the lymph system. And we call this a high output failure. 
It results in edema, which is usually low in protein. So our lymph system is still functioning. It's getting proteins out, but it's not keeping up with the demand. It's starting to overload because usually this is due to a venous uh, insufficiency. That venous system is not picking up that fluid. Or again, there's some factors that can lead to increased filtration. But essentially, our lymph system is normal, and it can't keep up with the demands of um, uh, the fluid that's building up into the interstitium because there's a fault with either that venous end or blood capillary end. Um, so this type of edema that you start to see, so as that fluid builds up into the tissue spaces, um, this is what we would see in cases like congestive heart failure, uh, DVT, uh, chronic venous insufficiency, hyponatremia. Uh, so again, if that venous is occluded by, let's say, a, a blood clot, that's going to cause more backflow into the blood capillary, and it's going to cause more filtration, more fluid out into that interstitium. Our lymph system will try to do our best to get that fluid out, but that venous system is not doing its job to get the rest. Remember, that lymph system usually only takes about 10%. It has capacity to take some more, but it's going to uh, go past that threshold, and we're going to see edema that's low in protein, and again, we call that a high output failure. So here we have some examples of some different edemas. So this bottom left corner, that's uh, congestive heart failure. So typically with uh, CHF, we see that pitting type of swelling. It's usually in the, below the knees. Um, and usually it's symmetrical. Uh, usually it's not painful. It will improve with elevation. Uh, they tend to get shorter, shortness of breath with uh, activity and when they're laying flat. Um, the middle picture, that's what we call chronic venous insufficiency, and in this case, it's bilateral. Usually, again, it's uh, symmetrical. Um, here, you don't see any fluid in the foot. It usually starts in that calf area. We see changes in the tissues related to that vein damage. So here, that discoloration is called hemosiderin stating. So um, as the, the veins get damaged um, and they're not bring, moving that fluid back, the red blood cells start to collect into the tissues and they get broken down and that hemosiderin that's in the red blood cells starts to stain the tissue. We usually see some atrophic changes as well. That skin gets really really hard, um, hairless, uh, dry, and typically these guys have pain with uh, exertion. So if they've been on their feet for a while, standing, prolonged activities, they'll complain of pain. Um, and uh, in the bottom right quarter, that's a DVT, so that's post-thrombotic syndrome. So that's uh, showing some CVI changes, but again, in just the one limb. That middle picture we have is uh, arterial disease. So these guys will have um, more intermittent claudication type symptoms. They'll have pain when they start doing activity. They have to usually stop. Usually elevation makes it worse. Uh, they tend to, to sleep in recliners. Um, they, they don't uh, like the feet right up, um, and they, they um, bring them up a little bit, but it's too painful to elevate. Um, and then in the top left corner, that's uh, what we refer to as lymph lipedema. So it's an accumulation of fat in the tissues. Uh, in this case, it's symmetrical. It's usually symmetrical. The foot's generally not involved. They have sort of a cellulite uh, appearance, and it's sort of hard and lumpy. They're, it's very painful to touch, almost bruised-like. And uh, it's due to an abnormal um, accumulation of fat in the tissues. So when we talk about lymphedema and we talk about that fluid balance and transport capacity, um, lymphedema is a classic example of a mechanical insufficiency of the system. So in this case, that transport capacity that's normally about 10 times higher than that average lymph load drops below that normal amount to lymph load. So we've had some damage to the system or that system is impaired um, in primary cases, they're born with a system that's not functioning properly, and that transport capacity is now reduced. And in some cases, it may still cope with that normal lymph node, but if that lymph load increases, it can over um, shoot that transport capacity and that lymph system will no longer be able to keep up 
uh, getting that fluid out of that interstitium. So we call this a low output failure, and it results in edema which is high in protein. And that's the classic characteristic of lymphedema that distinguishes it from other edemas. It has a high protein level. Again, lymph removes that protein from that interstitium um, and helps get it back into the bloodstream. So when that lymph system is not working, that fluid is going to build up and you're going to get that high concentration of, of protein-rich fluid. Okay. So here's our classic pictures of lymphedema. This is a breast cancer-related lymphedema. So you can see um, she's got swelling right through her arm all the way down into the hand. And then this is a, a case of primary lymphedema on the right here. And uh, here you see classic signs of lymphedema. So these big um, sort of lobules here, we call them panaces, and I don't know if you can see in the picture here, but it almost has sort of an orange peel appearance. So this is an accumulation of um, scar tissue and fat that builds up, and we're going to talk about the, the progression of lymphedema that results in that. Um, but classic signs of, of lymphedema is um, basically, if it's um, bilateral, it's always asymmetrical. Okay, and that has to do with some of the way that that fluid goes back into our system. And uh, the foot's always involved in most cases. It generally starts in the foot and moves its way up. And you see the classic skin changes that occur in lymphedema that are different than uh, in other edemas. So when we talk about pathophysiology of the lymph system, so essentially that transport port capacity is insufficient for that lymph load. So we have that mechanical insufficiency. So either there's been damage to the system that has reduced that transport capacity or they're born with a system that that normal capacity is reduced. So um, it, um, that normal fluid balance that occurs, that 10% of fluid that's generally picked up by the lymph system, that transport capacity can't keep up with that anymore. So we start to see that fluid build up and that high concentration of, of proteins. Proteins are hydrophilic. They attract water. And they're going to disrupt that fluid balance, um, particularly at that venous end. So it's going to cause more filtration, more fluid to leak out. It's going to attract more and more uh, fluid to collect into the interstitium. And so now there's extra pressure on that lymph system from that increased lymph load that it's having trouble moving. And over time, that's going to result in dilation of the lymphatic vessels. So over time, they get weak from all that pressure of moving that fluid. The valves now, the vessels start to dilate and the valves don't lead up anymore. So you start to get backflow um, into the lymphatic vessels. And, uh, and then that fluid starts to collect. Now, when proteins start to build up, um, those proteins aren't meant to be there. So the body starts to uh, essentially almost attack those proteins to try to get them out. There's an inflammatory process that will start. And it will trigger cells to come into the area. And we start to see scar tissue laid down into the tissue. We also start to see fatty tissue, adipose cells get triggered. And so you start to see this inflammatory process that results in this buildup of scar tissue and fatty tissue. And then those proteins and that scar tissue, and again, remember that lymph fluid contains some of those waste products, bugs and viruses. Now that's starting to build up in the tissues and it's getting trapped in that scar tissue and it becomes a culture medium. So uh, a lymphedema um, limb is very high risk for infection because of those bugs and viruses and that chronic inflammatory process just sitting there. Um, and then that infection, if it starts to develop into a cellulitis, that causes more scarring, more uh, damage to the lymph system, and worsens that lymphedema. So it's this chronic cycle that if you don't get the, the fluid moving, you don't get those proteins out of there, we're going to start to see this tissue damage occur and more and more tissue damage over time, more scar tissue, more inflammation, and high risk of infection. And they start getting into this cycle of infection, their lymphedema gets worse, and it's easier to get an infection, and that cycle will, will continue, and um, that uh, condition will continue to progress. So um, lymphedema is classified into different stages based on that pathophysiology. So um, the most accepted um, standard that's used for the staging is the International Society of Lymphology. So um, they use a staging of zero to three. So zero is what we refer to subclinical. So at this point, you don't usually see swelling, but the patient may start to have some sensory changes in their limb. So for example, a breast cancer patient that has had lymph nodes removed, um, they have a reduced transport capacity. 
Um, in this stage, they, you may not, you won't see swelling, but they may start to have some sense, subjective complaints of, you know, my arm feels funny sometimes. I can tell it's just kind of achy or it feels heavy when I'm using it, but I'm not really noticing swelling. And when I rest it, it gets better. At this point, um, the system is still working, but there is a reduced transport. So it may still be able to get that lymph load out, but at times it struggles and that fluid is sort of sitting in the tissues a bit longer. And so they're feeling that, but uh, it does get through the system and uh, um, eventually, it, you know, that transport, it's able to maintain that, but at times it struggles. So it's kind of the initial breakdown. It's starting to have a little bit of trouble of getting that fluid out. Stage one, um, at this point you do see edema. So in a breast cancer patient, um, they'll say, you know, at times my arm, it's, it swells, but you know, with elevation or first thing in the morning, it's a little better, it gets worse as I'm using the arm. They'll complain more of those sensory complaints. They'll say, uh, you know, it's, it starts to ache or it gets kind of heavy or this tight feeling and I, um, when I'm using my arm, um, but it tends to fluctuate. And with things like elevation, a little bit of gravity assist or a little bit of exercise that gets that muscle pump moving that lymphatic fluid, um, we can see some improvement with it. In stage two, if that's not treated and those pro that fluid starts to collect more and more and it, that transport capacity, that lymph system starts having more and more trouble getting it out, again, those proteins start to sit and you start to see that uh, uh, chronic inflammatory process begin and then you start to see that scar tissue and fat accumulation. So they start getting tissue damage at this point. So um, usually the swelling here will um, no longer fluctuate as much. It tends to be more consistent. So um, in the morning, it's not necessarily that much better, or sometimes as it progresses, it gets worse in the morning. Um, elevation usually doesn't have much effect because now there's scar tissue and it's gonna get trapped in there. Um, and typically, the limb will get larger, more parts of the limb will get affected, and uh, you start to see, again, more sensory complaints and uh, sometimes some infection at this point when the scarring starts to build up. And then the third stage, we refer to that as lymphostatic elephantitis. That's that um, picture that you saw earlier where they have these big lobules of scar tissue and fat and you see those skin changes when all that um, is in the tissues the skin is not going to get proper oxygenation and you start to see those changes in the skin and a lot of times people think that elephantitis refers to the size of the limb but it's actually referring more to the skin changes those skin changes are very characteristic of lymphedema again different from other types of edema and it's the the texture that puda orange the little wart like extensions that start to form that are dilated lymphatic vessels due to scar tissue. Um, those are the types of things that um, you see in this stage and typically that chronic cycle of infection. So the first two stages are reversible. At this point, the system is just barely coping, but with a little bit of help to reduce that lymph load. So things like compression, things like um, manual lymphatic drainage, exercise, activity modification can help to restore that uh, lymph load down that the system can cope with it. If you don't treat that and it progresses to stage two, it's irreversible. There's tissue damage at this point. That limb will not go back to normal, and without treatment, it will continue to get worse. Okay, so early management of lymphedema is critical um, because it can um, reduce the long-term complications and make a huge impact on what that effect will be on that patient. Okay. So the standard treatment for um, lymphedema is what we call CDT, and this is what that specialized training is for. There's usually two phases. Um, the first phase is what we call the intensive phase, and it's meant to reduce that limb. So there's a, a variety of components. Generally, there's manual lymphatic drainage, which is a, a very gentle massage-like technique that's designed to move the fluid into normal areas of lymphatic flows. So we're trying to reroute the system um, and channel the system away from that damaged area. And then there's a special bandaging technique that's used. Um, there's layers of, of short stretch bandages and usually some foam padding that helps to break up some of that scarring that's applied on the limb. And typically, if you have a quite significant amount of edema, um, that person will be seen on a daily basis where they're gonna have skin care, manual lymphatic drainage, bandaging, education, activity um, and they wear those bandages 24-7, so they're bandaged um, 
at the start of the day, they wear it through the night, and then they're seen again the next day. As that edema reduces, we reapply the bandages, we get that moving, we keep breaking down that scar tissue. And each day we reapply as that volume um, decreases to get more fluid pushing. Uh, through the system and eventually we're going to hopefully get to the point that we've reduced that limb to a smaller size and it becomes stable and then we enter into that second phase uh, which is the maintenance phase. So at this point this is typically where we put the garments um, on to maintain that reduction. Um, again some skin care, manual drainage, self care is, is um, the key in this component in this phase. So we teach them how to do some self-drainage, uh, how to do some self-bandaging, or we set them up with uh, day and night uh, garments that will have the effect of the bandages, and then um, exercise and long-term management. So it's quite intensive. If you get someone in a stage three, that gentleman there, um, we actually had that gentleman sent to the Mayo Clinic. <clears throat> and uh, for a really intensive CDT because we couldn't offer that here. He went for a nine week period. He was seen twice a day for CDT management and he lost 122 pounds of fluid. They actually had to stop because he was starting to get some, some blood pressure issues because again, you're pushing some of that back into the heart system and your heart system has to cope with that. Um, but this gentleman, he's a primary case. Um, he's had lymphedema since puberty, and he has never been managed through the system. He's been seen numerous times for infections, but uh, never actually, um, you know, got referred for lymphedema management. They basically told him nothing's going to work. Lymphedema is still a condition that's not well understood. CDT is not well um, understood. So oftentimes, especially primary cases, they go years trying to get diagnosed. And once they get diagnosed, there's very limited treatment that's offered to them. Um, so he had come in through our system about 10 years before. And um, this was before I was trained. So we had limited uh, options. And at that time, we tried to get him into an out-of-province um, uh, facility, but he was, um, him and his wife were going through in vitro at that time and he didn't want to leave. And he was very disheartened by the system. He had had numerous times where, you know, he was just told nothing's going to help and we couldn't offer him a whole lot. So he was just kind of hopeless at that point. He came back in the system. He started getting more and more infections and he started getting more life threatening infections. He was put into the hospital with sepsis. He almost, he was very critical in one of those episodes. Um, so his infections started getting more life-threatening and uh, he started to increase so much that functionally he was very uh, limited so that was why he came back was he had two little kids and he couldn't live his life with them and he was very emotional he um, had everything was adapted his clothing his workstation um, he couldn't go out with his family to like a, a regular restaurant he was at the point he wasn't able to work anymore or getting to that point even driving was becoming an issue and he was just at his end and he wanted to do something so he could be with his family a bit more and so we sent him to Mayo and in that case he's going to need more decongestive therapy so he's not right reduced but at that point in time they did need to stop because of that volume increase and he's likely going to need two or three more bouts of that um, to get him more reduced and get him to uh, a better position um, functionally. So I'm just going to go through this fairly quickly. So essentially, um, when we look at sort of lymphedema treatment, um, the main goals are ideally we want to prevent or minimize the risk. So for some of those secondary cases, if we can get to those cases very early, we can make a big difference in terms of reducing the risk of, of getting lymphedema. And if it does happen, we can keep it in that early stage so it has minimal impact on their life. Um, reducing edema, um, symptom control, range of motion, oftentimes they have some significant mobility issues as a result of the sheer size of their limb or um, mobility issues as a result of some of the scarring. And then the big, um, this is a chronic condition and they need long-term management. So the big uh, goal is, is self-management and long-term management, getting a treatment um, plan in place that's going to help maximize their system and control their system, their symptoms as much as possible and ensuring that they have all the tools that they can have to help them achieve that. And then in some cases we do um, some palliative management. So um, some of those cancer-related uh, lymphedemas, um, 
Sometimes you'll see what we call malignant lymphedema, where the tumor is um, blocking the flow of the lymphatic system, and they end up with some significant lymphedema. And in those cases, we're looking at more um, uh, comfort care and trying to reduce. We're not trying to get it right down, but we're trying to give them some relief from the pain that they're, they're having. So in terms of that treatment um, within that, that big picture, so stage zero, uh, again, at this point, they just need some education, um, understanding what lymphedema is, how to recognize those early signs and symptoms. Um, we may give them a compression garment if they're at a high risk of developing lymphedema and to use during high risk activities and uh, teaching them how to help their system through self-drainage and exercise. Stage one, we have that same component, but we're gonna basically um, be needing to do more and more treatment to keep that fluid down so their system is not coping anymore and it's gonna have periods where that limb's gonna swell and it needs a little bit more help to get that fluid uh, moving through. So at this point, um, again, we're gonna uh, use essentially what we did in stage zero, but they're gonna be wearing a compression garment now um, through their day. And um, at this point, we may look at doing some manual lymphatic drainage, or this is where the pump can come in as well, um, for periods of times during those flare-ups. Stage two, that's when they start to get that scar tissue tissue damage. So usually we do CDT at this point to bring the, the limb down and get some of that scar tissue broken up and, and then uh, reduce and stabilize into a, um, a garment. Here we definitely will um, incorporate pump into the mix just like we do with manual drainage. They may be needing regular lymphatic drainage and we can um, use the pump as a complement um, to help that process along. And then stage three, um, I haven't had much experience with using pump in stage three, just um, uh, typically I've done mostly stage two, but uh, um, Karen's gonna talk a little bit about um, how effective she has seen pump used in, in those really big cases with um, significant fibrosis. So, um, so now we're gonna switch gears and go into the actual um, pump. So what is intermittent pneumatic compression? So essentially what um, intermittent IPC is, is it's an external compress compressive forces that are generated by a pneumatic compression unit. That unit's um, connected to a garment that fits onto the affected area, and air is pumped into that garment, um, which there's different bladders or different compartments throughout that unit. And again, we're gonna go into more detail here later, but essentially you set the pressure on the machine and it's gonna fill that uh, compartment uh, or bladder up with air, and that's gonna cause some compression of the veins, arteries, and lymphatic vessels. Um, the mechanical forces are applied intermittently and usually in a sequential manner from distal to proximal, so we get that gradient pressure to move that fluid upward. Um, in that limb being treated. And in the new units, um, we have um, the garments will start in the torso area and it will move the fluid through those regions before it starts to drain the limb. Um, so we're getting that drainage effect. We're clearing the lymphatic system out into normal areas of the lymph flow so that this uh, affected limb has, um, is able to move through the system. So typically IPC are commonly referred to as lymphedema pump therapy or compression pump therapy. So that's typically what you'll see on your referrals. So in terms of the effect of compression, and this applies to all the, the different modalities we use in lymphedema management, so compression garments, um, uh, the pump, manual lymphatic drainage, bandages. Um, so essentially the biggest effect um, from the pumps end of things is it improves venous and lymphatic circulation. So we're gonna see an increase in that interstitial fluid pressure, um, which is gonna decrease. So it's gonna build more pressure on the outside of the capillary, and that's gonna change that gradient a little bit, and we're gonna see less filtration out of that capillary end. Um, it prevents reaccumulation of fluid. So again, by increasing the pressure in that interstitium, it's gonna create that high to low um, gradient from the interstitium to the venous, and it's gonna uh, create more resorption back into that venous end. Uh, and it reduces reflex of mobilized limbs. So it's gonna help to bring those valves closer together and um, reduce that backflow of fluid. Um, it also helps to increase efficiency of muscle pumps, so that external pressure when the muscle um, contracts a little bit against external pressure, so we see this a lot uh, with bandages or with uh, compression garments, 
uh, that's going to create more resistance against that vessel and it's going to help that muscle pump action. Um, in bandaging, we use a lot of uh, foam products that help to reduce that scar tissue, helps to soften that lymphatic um, scar tissue. And uh, we start to see the breakdown of the scar tissue and inflammatory changes and we start to get better oxygenation to the skin and we'll start to see a vast improvement in those skin changes. And then from a garment point of view, it helps to restore shape um, to the affected limb. So by reducing, again, all that scar tissue, all that fluid, we're going to start getting a more uniform shape to the limb and then the garment's going to help to maintain that. Okay, so um, as we mentioned earlier, Pumps were used, uh, have been used for many years, and initially in the 1950s, um, we saw the use of single chamber pumps, and then over time that sort of moved to multi-chamber segmented, um, without any manual control, so they weren't calibrated, and, uh, and then we kind of progressed into um, segmented, calibrated, and then we have the new options today. So we're gonna just take a real quick look at these. So this is the single chamber pump. So at, how this worked was there was a single cell that expanded and contract, applying pressure to the limb. So there was um, no gradient here. Um, Karen had a good example or analogy of a, a toothpaste, squeezing a toothpaste uh, bottle. So fluid would sort of um, move in both directions and no sort of gradient to it. And so this was not optimal for lymphedema management. We need that gradient to push that fluid up into that uh, lymph node region and through the rest of the lymphatic system. And then we move to these three chambered pumps. Um, and uh, these inflate, inflate sequentially from distal to proximal until it's all inflated and then it deflates together. So it would increase that bottom compartment, then the next one, then the next one, and then it would release and start over again. Um, again, there was limited programming options, um, so that pressure was pretty much set. Um, and then... Um, you could use these on both limbs or, or individually. Um, and these were the pumps that were loaned out uh, to patients. This was what the sale policy covered. And so um, it was during this time that we started to see some problems and some of that sort of uh, controversy over the use of the pumps because we, we were just getting the fluid up um, to the top. We weren't getting that gradient and we weren't getting sort of that flow through the rest of the system. Then we move to these pumps, and we use these in the department for years. Um, there's more chambers in these, so these are 12 chambered. Um, and these have uh, gradient pressure, um, higher pressures distally and, and lower in the proximal chambers. So we did get a gradient here. Um, and uh, there was some, some degree of calibration here. So we could set the pressure in, in the different compartments and, and the unit, and that allowed um, for a little bit more um, uh, special, like, specialized pressure there. But there was some problems with this. Again, when it wasn't used properly, um, there's some research that came out around these pumps that showed that with long-term use, because the pump just took it up to, so in this case it's a leg, that fluid's going to move from the foot up to the groin. If that particular patient had some transport issues, uh, their system... Um, did have some significant uh, um, problems clearing that fluid, we'd see that fluid start to collect proximally. So we start to see increased genital or abdominal or proximal uh, leg edema. And in the arm, we'd start to see some chest proximal shoulder uh, collection. And over time, if that, again, that fluid sits, those proteins start to get broken down, that inflammation process and scar tissue. So there were some studies that showed there was a uh, fibrosclerotic ring that would form proximally, and then that would create more blockage and that lymphedema would get a little bit worse. Um, so that's kind of when we first started noticing or hearing a lot of pump is not good and, and there's problems with pump. But again, I think some of it was that it wasn't used properly. Ideally, if you do some drainage before using this pump, it can be quite effective. Um, you just have to get that clearance for that fluid to move through. And for some patients, this actually worked quite well. And in their case, their system was able to, to move that fluid once it got proximally. They had enough um, lymph uh, transport there that it continued to make um, 
uh, that fluid move through the system. There was a patient that uh, I met up with at a lymphedema conference, and he uses these this type of pump, and he's used it for 12 years, and it's very effective for him, and he's never had any problems. Um, we talked about the newer pumps, and we talked about drainage, but for him, um, it just seemed to work without any issues. And so um, for some people, it did work, but for others, we did see these problems if it wasn't managed with some of the other treatment techniques. And then we now have these new um, products, and uh, that's what uh, this afternoon presentation is going to be. And um, um, they're going to go into a lot more detail, but essentially um, these products mimic lymphatic drainage. So they're going to clear the, if it's an arm, they're going to clear the torso and trunk and chest area. They're going to move all that fluid first. There's a, a um, a phase of what we call pre-therapy and again it's going to move that fluid into the normal areas of lymphatic flow and it's going to um, it facilitate an area that this fluid is going to be able to move through and not congest and then it's going to start on the, the limb and it's going to start through the top and work its way down again clearing all of that fluid out of the way decongesting the limb and then it's going to uh, move into a sequential gradient and move from the bottom through to the the top. It also has um, some differences in terms of that pressure, that pressure and release um, versus the other ones that would increase uh, pressure, maintain that, and continue on. Um, so again, sim more similar to a manual lymphatic drainage, and um, Karen has a great slide that kind of shows the, the progression of these pumps here. Um, so this is an example, and you're going to see these later today. So this is the arm garment. So again, there's a full truncal um, piece, and then the leg garment, which has that full bottom trunk and abdomen piece. Okay, in terms of evidence um, for IPC, the references that I used for this um, include a study, um, which uh, was a systemic review. Um, done by, um, by a, a group, this was a project for the best practice management document, international consensus document for lymphedema, and they did a systemic review, a system, systemic, systematic review of the literature. And I chose this because a lot of the therapists, this information is in the best practice um, document and it's the evidence for IPC in the document and the reason I chose this is because a lot of therapists are going to read that document and they're going to go to that for their information and so um, what you're going to see some of the there's still some questions about pump and part of that is um, some of the research there's still not real definite uh, research around um, pressure gradients and frequency uh, and treatment time, and there's still some evidence that's uh, um, sort of confusing as to uh, the benefits of pump, but there's, there's lots of research out there that's really good, and, and we're going to go through some of that today. But I kind of wanted to go through this because it's uh, a little bit still confusing, and, and it's not clear, and um, I wanted to put my perspective on some of this. So basically, they looked at this, um, they did a, a full literature review. Um, they uh, started with um, the term lymphedema, and they, they uh, got about 6,000 articles, and then they started applying inclusion and exclusion criteria, and they started applying more uh, terms around IPC, and then they basically filtered through all those uh, uh, papers, and they came down to 13 articles, and then they applied the um, bandolier strength of evidence to, um, uh, the different levels of strength of, of uh, the research to each article. So there is two level one um, systematic reviews on IPC uh, associated with breast cancer related lymphedema. Um, so the first study in 2010 showed no evidence to suggest the use of IPC in the treatment of upper extremity lymphedema, um, that it provides any greater reduction in lymphedema than education on arm care and skin care. But then we had another study by um, Mosley in 2007 that showed that um, IPC was actually the most likely to provide, to provide greater volume metric reduction in the treatment of breast cancer-related lymphedema. So kind of confusing. You've got some studies that show no, no real benefit, and then um, some studies that show it, it, uh, it was actually one of the best modalities to use. So there's some additional research um, that I think Karen's going to refer to, um, and you were given 
a handout from the company uh, that um, has a number of clinical studies and there is a, a real good one on breast cancer and, and it does show um, some additional effect of IPC in breast cancer related lymphedema. So then um, the remaining 11 articles that were uh, 11, level two and that's supposed to say level three reported a broad representation of outcomes and they looked at um, different variables. So physiological changes that were associated with IPC, device use, parameters, and volumetric changes. So when they looked at physiological changes, there was lots of studies that showed there was big benefit. Um, uh, physiologically, they saw uh, a reduction in that filtration rate and increase in resorption rate with pumps. Um, this particular study showed that uh, tissue pressure and flow under the skin um, of the lymphedema they looked at the tissue pressure and flow under the skin in lymphedema stage two to four. Okay, that's a different staging system. That's basically stage one to three in the system that we used. And they saw that IPC generated tissue fluid pressures on average 20% lower than the pressure in the inflated sleeve chambers. And that variance was attributed to skin rigidity, so that scar tissue, um, low conductivity of that subcutis um, level of tissue, and dissipation of the applied force in the subcutis um, to the non-compressed regions. So basically, um, what I want to point out with this study is that that pressure does dissipate. Some of the controversy years ago was that um, some of the, the pumps were used at too high pressures, which caused some um, ischemic changes in, in the uh, vessels. And when you look at your handout um, and you see the protocols, you're going to see some high pressures there. But it's important to understand that that pressure does get dissipated. And in areas of fibrosis or higher density tissue, um, you're going to see, you, you may need uh, a little bit higher pressure. And again, Karen's going to go through some of those parameters and talk about uh, using uh, pressure with uh, fibrotic tissue. In terms of pressure level, um, there was a study that looked at the settings routinely used. Um, were well in excess of pressures measured within normal lymphatic vessels. So on average, that pressure is about four to eight millimeters of mercury. But in endemitous lymphatics, they found that that tissue pressure was actually significantly elevated uh, to a level of about 15 to 18. So what they found was uh, an ideal pressure level was about 25 to 50 in the absence of fibrosis. Again, with that uh, scar tissue, um, there's going to be more resistance to that pressure and more of that pressure is going to be dissipated. So they, those areas may require a higher level of pressure. Another study on pressure level. Um, so this was a review of some of the literature on the indications for compression therapy in both venous and lymphatic diseases. Um, so they looked at the skin microcirculation um, and they saw some studies that showed that ischemic skin changes occurred from that high level of compression for long periods. And they found that a sustained pressure of 60 to 70 was considered that upper limit before you started to see those ischemic changes. Uh, another um, study on pressure level stated that IPC must be used at relatively low pressures to avoid collapse of superficial lymphatics as part of a comprehensive CDT program. So um, MLD alone or in conjunction with IPC at about 50 millimeters of mercury as part of that full protocol resulted in notable reduction. So they started implementing that um, pump within that full picture of CDT and found that the combination of the two um, resulted in, in good reduction. In terms of treatment times and frequency, um, this is interesting because this, this study analyzed self-reported data from a survey on home-based uh, IPC treatments. So they set these patients up at home and they prescribed a protocol of one hour, two times a day for a month, and then they moved into one hour a day for maintenance. They found no significant association was found between reported use pattern and age, gender, lymph lymphedema severity, or time of diagnosis. So when they looked at these patients and both cases of sort to primary and secondary, they found that um, there was a wide variance of compliancy to that protocol. And you will see this clinically. So um, 
Again, there's, you'll see that there's no standard frequency um, time and uh, um, we will generally recommend about an hour, um, but we will have to assess that. We will start um, with a short period of time, so maybe 20, 30 minutes, see how they respond, and then we build that up. And generally, we use the pump for about um, that 30 to, to an hour period in a day. It can be used up to two hours. Um, that's sort of an accepted um, cl clinical frequency. But you will see patients will come back and they'll, they'll sort of do their own thing. They'll come back and they'll um, say that, uh, you know, they'll, they'll go on for a couple hours, twice a day. Sometimes they'll change their pressure. They'll increase it. And I think the most important thing here is that it needs to be constantly assessed and monitored. And you need to see if that's effective or it's causing some harm. So, um, uh, you need to um, work with your client and do objective reassessment and uh, find what is going to be realistic for them but what's going to be safe and effective. In terms of volume changes, um, so this study here compared the use of single and three compartment sleeves found in IPC, reduced the extent of edema. They hypothesized that the wave uh, in, in the compression um, is directed centropedally, so it goes distal to proximal. So that's opposite from manual lymphatic drainage. And again, these are those single and three-chambered compartments. They found that if there was any blockage that ham hampered lymphatic outflow, the pressure wave shift um, to the proximal extremity may hamper lymphatic drainage if it's not preceded by emptying of the proximal lymphatic vessels. So again, um, this just further illustrates that those sequential um, pumps need to have clearance before um, in order to push that fluid through and not get that backflow. Um, and these units do, but you're still going to see these out in the community. And if you're a CLT therapist or you're coming across lymphedema patients, you need to assess if they're still using these at home. And if they are, ideally now we can switch them over to, to this unit. Um, but they need to be seen um, by that lymphedema therapist and make sure they're getting that clearance and that that full uh, treatment plan is in place. So the, the document came out with um, sort of a summary of the clinical implications and pra best practice. So there's some additional studies they looked at. And they found level two and three evidence to support those physiological changes associated with fluid uptake, um, as well as that volumetric metric reduction of lymphedema with IPC. There was some evidence from some of the studies that um, suggested that the tissue fluid transport is not associated with transport of macromolecules, proteins, from the interstitial tissue. So this is where it's a little bit uh, confusing and controversial about the use of it with uh, fibrosis. And that's why, too, again, if you're reading the best practice, um, it, it, this is a little bit confusing. Now, Karen's going to go over some studies, and in your handout, there's lots of really good studies that um, have used IPC with tissue fibrosis, and there's some good changes with that. And I know in my practice, I've started to use it more and more in some of those later stage two where there is fibrosis, and we combine it with um, that complete decongestive therapy, and we'll use um, some foam padding or swell spots with the pump to, to help break down that fibrosis, and we've seen some good results results with that. So um, Karen will talk a little bit more about uh, that aspect. And then there's level one to three evidence that supports compression pressures in the range of 30 to 60. So if you go to the best practice document or you go to NLN, this is the general recommendation for compression pressures. But you will see in your um, a handout from the company that uh, you'll see a little bit of a range on that. And you will see a little different range in the literature because, again, there's, um, you know, there's a little bit of discrepancy there. But, um, again, Karen's going to talk about that fibrosis, and that's where you start to see those higher levels of compression. And again, no consensus on frequency. So we're going to talk about clinically what we do and how to kind of work with assessment of that. So basically, the verdict is that there is a viable place for IPC devices to be utilized as an adjunct to CDT. So you basically um, are not using IPC as a standalone treatment 
okay? You're using it within that big picture of lymphedema and it can be a very useful adjunct. You can um, incorporate it with your drainage component, so manual lymphatic drainage. You can utilize the pump to help achieve those effects. And with the combination of the bandaging, the um, scar tissue breakdown, the education, the activity modification, it can uh, be very effective. Um, but it needs to be individualized and it needs to be assessed. A pump is not appropriate for everyone or it needs to be complemented with um, uh, a number of those other treatments. Uh, there's some patients that I will do a combination of manual lymphatic drainage with pump. Um, so sometimes if they have a lot of scarring, so let's say our breast cancer patients that have extensive radiation fibrosis and they have lots of blockage to the flow here, uh, we will do some treatments on that um, fibrosis and we'll get some, some uh, manual drainage started through there and then we may use pump to get the rest of the effect there. Um, versus doing that on a, on a regular basis. Okay. So there's a lot um, that uh, pump can offer for patients, but it, again, it's used in combination. So um, this part, uh, Karen's going to go through a lot of this. So I'm going to just touch base on sort of that big picture. So again, uh, IPC is an adjunct, not a standalone treatment. Um, it can be used in that intensive reduction phase. So when we're trying to bring that fluid down, we can use that IPC for that manual lymphatic drainage. We can use it in combination. And then oftentimes um, it's used in that long-term self-care management um, for selected patients, that phase two, where we've reduced them and we need a program in place to keep them there. And uh, that home pump um, can uh, play a big role in that. Um, caution in palliative cases, but you need to work with your oncology team. Again, a lot of times the goal is not to reduce edema, but for comfort. And there is some role that manual lymphatic drainage, compression, and IPC can play in that. Lymphedema patients need to be assessed by a CLT therapist. So again, because... Um, it fits in that big picture and every patient is gonna need different requirements of that. Pump may not be appropriate for everyone or it, it may need to be applied in, in um, combination in certain ways. That therapist needs to decide what's appropriate and then they can refer that patient on. Uh, the assistance we use in our department to apply the pump. Um, so we set up all the parameters and we constantly reassess. We bring them back. Um, for drainage, um, to work with the pump, and we reassess to see how effective that's working and, and may need to adjust that pressure or that frequency time. Um, and uh, in terms of indication, so Karen's going to go again over this, um, so I'm going to go quickly through some of this, but essentially pump is used for venous insufficiency, so conditions where that venous pump um, is ineffective and, and we need to improve that venous return as well as lymphedema in combination with the CDT uh, treatment. In terms of contraindications, it's the same uh, contraindications that you'll see with any other type of lymphatic treatment, the CDT, the compression. Um, so infection, arterial disease, any sort of occlusion, DVT or pulmonary embolism, um, we're going to be increasing that pressure. And if there's a blockage there, that can either disrupt that DVT or it's going to cause um, more pressure backflow. Um, uncontrolled uh, CHF, cardiac disease. Um, ischemic vascular disease, hypertension, uncontrolled hypertension. Um, renal dysfunction and untreated active malignancy, again, um, you have to work with your oncology team. These are a little bit gray. There is a role that you can use these things, but in severe cases and in cases that it's, you're not sure if there is a malignancy there or it is in an untreated um, point, you have to work with your oncology team and uh, um, and then that can sort of guide you along in, in terms of uh, the use of compression. Um, and then uh, I'll let you read through the rest again. Karen's going to point out the, the big red flags. And, uh, and then there's also relative contraindications where you have to take some extra caution. So if there's sensory de deficits, again, that malignancy, working with your oncology team, if things are stable, um, depending on the characteristics and their treatment program, um, we can definitely be using compression and IPC, but it needs to be very um, monitored along the way. 
Uh, any untreated wounds, um, it works quite well in wound management, but um, that wound has to be um, seen and treated. And then um, once that process is started, the pump's going to help actually continue that healing process. Um, fragile skin, um, you need to monitor for edema at the root of the affected limb or, or truncal edema. So if they have a lot of congestion here, again, um, in that case, you want to make sure they're getting effective drainage. So that needs to be monitored or you need to use that in combination with manual lymphatic drainage. So in some people that have a lot of truncal uh, edema or proximal edema, I'll get them doing self-drainage before they come in for the pump. And then, um, because it's a mechanical unit, you always have to make sure that it's working properly. So we have regular inspection of our units. In terms of assessment, um, so again, um, the staging of lymphedema. So in, the, in stage one, where they're using um, manual lymphatic drainage during flare-ups, um, you can certainly use IPC, you know, if they're having regular flare-ups. Um, um, but if they're, you know, managing well with compression, education, and their self-drainage, you may not have to use pump a, a whole lot in that first stage. Certainly in stage two, where you're really trying to reduce and, and they need constant compression, otherwise their condition will worsen. Um, if you're seeing them frequently for manual lymphatic drainage or there is a need that they have to keep moving that fluid, otherwise their, their condition doesn't control, that's where pump can really come in to help complement that. So whether that's within the, the um, clinical setting, um, because we're not going to be able to see them that regular um, for manual lymphatic drainage just because of our, our clinical time and our resources, pump can help um, provide that in addition to the manual drainage. And certainly um, for home use, if they have to rely on regular uh, manual lymphatic drainage to keep their system going, a pump can help them through that. Um, also, their, their goals, their lifestyle demands. Um, some patients will be compliant with that. It's, it's not easy. Self-management for lymphedema is intense. Bandaging daily, manual lymphatic drainage daily, exercise, modifying their activities, putting those garments on day in, day out, at nighttime. And so um, something like pump in, the, in terms of home pump can be more realistic for them um, to manage and can help achieve those goals. Um, we do have to monitor blood pressure. Again, you're moving fluid back into the system, and so um, you need to make sure that they're tolerating this. And if there is some other comorbidities, you have to be very um, regular in terms of monitoring and making sure that you're at a safe level um, for their system. Um, and then you do need to do regular monitoring, again, if um, depending on their system, how effective that, that clearance is with that pump. Um, they may need to add some additional uh, drainage, self-drainage component to that. You may need to add fibrosis pads in certain areas, um, more compression in, in uh, certain areas to help that. Um, and uh, we repeat volumes and uh, on a regular basis. So when we, we start a patient, we do a trial period to see if it's effective. We'll start them with about half an hour, see how they tolerate. We monitor their blood pressure. We do the volume um, measures. And then we build that up. And, uh, and we do that over a, a, about a month period of time. And we, we, we consistently measure um, their volume and see if that is effective for them. And if if it is, then we build that pump into sort of a, a program for them. So they may not necessarily be coming regular for a month, but more periodic in combination with the other treatments um, or on a long-term sort of maintenance program. So um, again, uh, we're going to go through this a little bit later, um, but the general guidelines um, that we use is about 30 to 50 for the upper extremity and 30 to 60 for the lower extremity. Um, treatment time is anywhere between half an hour to up to two hours in the department. We definitely do 60 uh, minutes as a max. Um, at home, they may do twice a day or, and again, sometimes if uh, um, we may have to adjust that depending on their, their condition. And uh, basically, um, you need to find the protocol that you're going to see good reduction and maintenance of that edema. So in terms of... Um, documentation. 
we have put together some new forms for the new CLT therapists. So Janice Block, one of the therapists, uh, she actually um, has documented, drafted a, a treatment plan. And so the therapist is going to have um, an assessment form where we're going to rule out any contraindications, uh, um, any special considerations, what type of compression, what level, what frequency, and then uh, that's going to be put in their file and used with the assistance. And then there's a progress sheet that's been put together um, to, for documentation, and that includes um, blood pressure uh, readings and their response to treatment, and that will be part of the package. There's also some patient education uh, forms that are being developed for home use on instructions on pump. And, um, and that's going to be going out next week. So for the regions that have pumps, the CLT therapist will do the initial assessment. They will do um, that full treatment plan, and that will be referred out. And then they need to bring the patients back on a regular basis, reassess, and then make modifications to that plan if uh, that pump is being done elsewhere. 